Hello and welcome to Go Create the Opera Imaginarium. We're going to explore all things opera. I'm Karen Gillingham and I'm a director. You've just seen a clip from Garsington Opera's production of Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onyegin. It's such a wonderful production and a huge team of people go in to help create the wonderful spectacle that you see. Of course, there's musicians and singers in it, but there's also a whole team of creatives. So to help us explore that today, we've got Richard Taylor, composer, Natasha Kamjani, choreographer, Rhiannon Newman-Brown designer and our fab singers today are Jerome Knox and Satria Krishna. Great to see you. So we are going to be looking at the second act of our opera Eugene Onyegin and we need to really think about the story so far. Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onyegin is a love story set in Russia in the early 19th century. In Act 1, a wealthy young man from the capital, Onyegin, is visiting his country estate. His friend Lensky takes him to the neighbouring Larina estate to introduce Onyegin to his fiancée Olga and to her sister Tatiana. Tatiana immediately falls in love with the sophisticated Onyegin and that night writes him a letter declaring her love. Sadly, Onyegin visits her the next day and rejects her, saying that he could only love her as a brother. I have received this very exciting invitation here from a lad on a horse, and let's open it. I can do it with you here. So it says, Dear Madame Karen, extremely posh, you are invited to Tatiana's name day ball. Best wishes, the Larina family. Whoa, a ball. I absolutely love getting dressed up, dancing, eating lovely food, and there's definitely got to be some singing, right? So let's go to Richard to learn a song. There certainly will be some singing, Karen. And I think we should stand up, not me, because I'm playing the piano, but why don't you stand up, make sure your shoulders are nice and relaxed. Here's Tash going to show us some fantastic movements. Karen's going to show us the words. And we're going to sing a chorus about how surprised you are to be invited to this name day celebration ball. And it's amazing, as the words will tell you, because you've barely been acknowledged by the people that are throwing this ball before. And here you are, suddenly not only being acknowledged, but introduced and to society and be given this party as well. This is brilliant. The words are, what a surprise for us, an invitation, a name day, what a celebration, what a joy. That's the first half. It's a, a song of two halves, this. So we'll do the first half first. Okay, and the tune goes like this. What a surprise for us, an invitation, a name day, what a celebration, what a joy. Got it? Brilliant. So it's a really good tune. It's one of the most fantastically singable tunes. The second half is the longest sentence in history. So we've got to somehow take a breath or we'll never get through it. So the words are, we cannot remember when we last were treated to a ball or greeted at all. Do you see what I mean? So I think if you take a breath after remember, <gasps> when we last were treated to a ball, take another breath, <gasps> or greeted at all, then you'll get through it. And the tune is great because it's like going down steps. And it goes, we cannot remember when we last were treated to a ball or greeted at all. Got it? So there's a funny little bit in the middle where you sing two, two, two notes to one word, which is a very operatic thing to do. Uh, when we last were, when we last were, you got that? So, shall we go all the way through? All the way through from the beginning, here we go! What a surprise for us! A name day, what a celebration, what a joy we cannot remember when we last were treated to a ball or greeted at all. Ah, I see Satria has an invite as well. 
Yes, it's an invite to Tatiana's name day. So we're all going to be going to this wonderful ball, but a fascinating fact is that name days in Russia are linked to the saint after which you're named your Christian name. And every saint has a particular day in the calendar and that is the day of your name day. They'd be a big celebration and in Russia and Eastern Europe, these days are even more important than your birthday itself. So, um, this is Lensky's best friend, Onyegin, who's also received an invite, haven't you, to the ball, and how are you feeling about going? Country dances are a bit dull for me. I much prefer <laughs> the city ones. And what about you, Satria? Lensky, I should say, sorry. Well, I'm looking forward to it. This is my first time I could dance with Olga <gasps> and without the watchful of her mum, Madame Larina. So I'm really looking forward to this day. Oh, I totally bet you are. And what kind of, can you just give us a bit of an example of the type of dance that you might be doing at this ball? I will have a lesson with Natasha. <gasps> Maybe you please join us. Absolutely. I think we're all very happy to go to a dance lesson with Natasha. So everyone join us. All right, come and find a space. You guys at home, make sure you're up on your feet. Um, the ballroom dance we're going to be looking at has got the step of the waltz in it. It's also got the cotillion, and we're using movement from the actual production from Garsington Opera's um, production from 2016. So it's got, got hints of it and then a little mix. The first thing we're gonna look at is our posture, because we need to stand up really poised and tall. So just take a rise, wherever you are, try and balance, and as you come down, try to lengthen your spine even taller. Shoulders back, face really bright and open, because you never know who you're gonna see and just go for an elegant walk around your space, just feeling the length through your spine. Really get those shoulders back. And then as you're walking around the space, try to catch somebody's eye near you. Maybe a mischievous look, maybe happy to see them, maybe not happy to see them. But the looks, the face is very important because as Satria said, you never know who you're gonna meet. It's exciting to be there, not under the watchful eye of Olga's mum. So, I'm going to teach you a bow and a curtsy. You can choose which one you do. Traditionally, the gents would bow. You guys ready? Let's take a bow. Hands behind your back if you like. Or you could even have one hand behind your back. And a curtsy, we're all going to give it a go. So you just take one leg behind you. And if you had a ballroom gown on, you take your arms out there. Try the other side. Everyone have a go at that as well. So you can just feel which one you want to do. And now we need to grab our partners. We've decided we're going to use jackets today. So we're going to head over. Thank you, Rhiannon and we're gonna learn our traditional ballroom step. Just drape your jacket over your hands. I need to just go over the waltz step with everybody. So just, just hold it comfortably. We're gonna do slow, quick, quick with your feet. Just traveling around the space. So slow, quick, quick, slow. Don't forget your posture, shoulders back. Really travel. Just relax into it. Your arms are relaxed, everything's relaxed. You're looking very good here, guys. Then try it on the spot, just a little bit harder. So down, quick, quick, down. And now, I'm gonna really push you out of your comfort zone. Just facing the sides, we're gonna try to spin it. You guys ready? The leg nearest the camera is gonna go round and round and then travel towards the screen and back again. Push round. We're gonna do that a couple more times. Push forward and uh, back, just give it a go, don't worry. If you're getting in a muddle, it really doesn't matter. It's all about having fun and getting moving. Try it again, push round. Good. All right. Thank you, Richard. I'm gonna take you through it from the top of the routine that we are going to practice today. We're gonna to start off with that bow and that curtsy. So you're gonna take your bow, curtsy, take your time there, and then you're gonna grab your partner. Gentlemen, traditionally on the left, ladies, traditionally on the right, but you can do whatever you want with whoever's there. And if you wanna grab a jacket or a dress, please do. So once you've done your bow and your curtsy, we're gonna push straight into that turning waltz. And like I said, it doesn't matter if it's going wrong, just have fun with it. So you're gonna push round. A one, ta, ta, one. Then you're going forward, just a little lean. Do that again, take it round. And then try this step. You're gonna push away. You're gonna go push away, come back and grab the jacket, push away and grab the jacket. You okay with that? Let's just have a look at that. So, you're holding a hand, you're just gonna push them away, show them off, your hands low, you're gliding out, and then you're grabbing your partner back in. Pushing away, 
and grabbing them back in. And then you're gonna take them for a promenade, a walk around you, showing off what they're wearing, feeling really proud of your partner around like that. Let's go with the music from the waltz step, turning into that, ready? Here we go. Turn it, turn it, leaning forwards and back, free it up a little bit, just get round, just get on with it. And hit into your pushes away. Here we go, pushing away and back, making eye contact, promenade that jacket or your partner around. Lovely, from there, we're gonna do a twizzle. A twizzle for us with our jackets, we're gonna hold onto the top of our hanger. Inside shoulder of your partner, you're gonna turn them under your arm. So they're gonna dip down and spin under your arm. And then the other person has a go. The other person has a go, Wanda. You ready to give that a go, guys? It's quite tricky with the jackets. Here we go. So turn, twizzle your partner under. Then you're gonna twizzle under. And then we're gonna go for a promenade around. So round you go. You can one step it or you can just step, it's up to you. Coming back. The last bit we're gonna add on is you're gonna face your partner. You can hold ha both hands of your partner if you like. Or if you've got a jacket or a dress, you're gonna hold their shoulders. It is a bit tough on the, on the arms, I'm gonna admit here. So we, we've gotta try and hold it out. So we've got our frame, the ballroom frame. We're gonna gallop towards you for six and you gallop towards us for six with the leg that's nearest the screen. You ready? Go one, two, three, four, five, six. Then give me a stamp. We're gonna hold it there. So you've got a stamp. And then I'm just gonna show you what the in out bit is. It's like a scarecrow in out. So you knock your knees together, in, out, that's it, lovely. Great, so you've got your six gallops and then your stamp in, out, but all the time you're still holding on to your partner. And then you do the same thing traveling backwards. Let's go for it. And going backwards, one, two, three, four, looking into their eyes, six, and you've got your stamp in, out. And then you would bow or curtsy at the end and perhaps change partners. We're gonna go from the bow and the curtsy. Richard, are you ready? And coming up slowly, slowly getting ready to get your partner. Get ready to turn and whizzing round. Lovely. And again, push. That's it. Reaching away, reach away and in. <laughs> Promenade the jacket around, just enjoy it. Doesn't matter if it's going on. Twizzle, twizzle. And then you go for the twizzle under the person's arm. And then we're going to go for a promenade, taking it round, into your gallops, get ready Ooh. to gallop, gallop it, good, you look great guys, stand, take it back, hold that jacket away a bit more Karen, spread out. Well, I want you to all imagine you, you are all at this Larina family ball and you're having a wonderful time dancing. And then you spot Lensky, who's taken his friend Onyegin aside and he looks pretty miserable. Let's hope it's nothing too serious. My friend, you look miserable. Why should love come and join the party? Come and join the party. You look so gloomy, man. Oh, gloomy, no, 
your sights on my Olga, says Lensky. This is a very tense moment and I guess if it was today they would have just had a good old punch up but no, in 19th century Russia young men like this had to behave very differently and they were watched by all of their family and the whole of their family could be disgraced if they behaved badly. So, a fascinating fact, he's challenged him to a duel and in the 19th century if you then picked the glove up like Onyega and Lenski's opponents did that meant that you'd signed a contract to have a duel. So let's speed ahead to the next morning where this duel takes place and we're going to need the expertise of Rhiannon to show us how we transform this set. As a designer there are some very important bits of research that we need to know for this scene. So the first thing is, is that duels always happened at dawn. Now there's a very good reason for this. They were illegal. So in all of Europe and America, it was illegal to have a, a duel. So it would happen at dawn because that is when the light is very low and very shadowy. So people would not be seen. And the other bit of critical information is, is that they would normally happen in a clearing in a forest because the participants of a duel had to be about 10 metres apart. So on stage, we need to create that much space. So behind me here is the brilliant uh, design uh, for this scene from Tom Piper's design for this production. And uh, we also have a production shot a photograph to show you where you can see it in action with all the lighting. And what is really amazing about this particular set is the way that uh, the designer Tom has chosen this very pale grey tone for this wood, which makes it feel very eerie and uncertain. And it's very different in contrast to the set just before um, for the Lariners party where it was golden and warm and domestic and felt very comfortable. So the audience there are on a journey uh, because those two things are in relationship to each other. The other very clever thing is just that instead of a normal forest uh, backdrop here, so just vertical trees, we have angles and um, diagonals, which again just underpins for the audience this really uneasy um, situation that these two characters find themselves in. Now from the production photograph here, you can see how important the lighting is in creating this atmosphere. And I am very lucky to have with me here, Dan Street, who is a lighting designer. Hi, Dan. Hey, Rihanna, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good to see you. So can you tell us a little bit more about how lighting is helping tell this story in this scene? I can indeed. Uh, so from what you've said, we first thing we have to do as a lighting designer is we have to know the facts. We have to have a look at the script, we have to have a look at the rehearsals, and we have to have a look at the scenic design, which you've already said, we've set the scene, we know exactly where we are, we're about to go into a duel. So we might think about something sinister, something shadowy, and also 
saying that it's a jewel, we know when it's set now, it's set at sunrise. So therefore, we wouldn't light it really bright. As you've already said, it would be quite dim, it'd be quite shadowy. So that would choose, the, the light designer would therefore choose exactly how to do that in the scene. You'd have seen from the production shots that we've got the sun coming in through the set, through a really shadowy backdrop, creating these lovely shadows across all the wood and across all the scenery, which extends right across the back of the set. So Dan, we're in the fabulous theatre here at Garsington Opera and I can see some very large and rather hot lights around us. So can you show us what you mean? I can indeed. So part of the extension as to what Rihanna's just asked me is how we would actually come to put the lights in the theatre. There's lots of different lights that we can choose. We've got lights that we can change colour. We've got lights that we can put texture in, which we call a gobo, if we're going to perhaps be in a forest. And in this scenario, we've got what we call a fresnel. And the fresnel is the type of lens, which is a really soft light, which is helping us give this beautiful shadow that we've got across the scenery. So with this big 10K fresnel, which is a really bright lamp that we've got behind me, if we were to show the sun and the shadow emulating across this set at the moment. If we get our wonderful technical team to move the lamp back at the moment, we'll see the sun move across the set and the shadows will get bigger. So if they start moving our light for us now, then you can see across the back of the set that we're emulating now, the sun is moving and all of the shadows are getting bigger and broader across the set. That's really exciting. I love seeing the way that changes when you just move that light just a little bit. But the other thing we must think about as designers is there are performers in this space. It's not just about making the set look beautiful. So we are going to welcome Satria into our little uh, lighting session here and see what happens when we light a body in this space. Absolutely. So uh, whenever we uh, light performers uh, in a theatrical setting, uh, but also an extension to that, there's many other forms this applies to. Uh, we have uh, front light, we have top light, and we have side light and back light. And from the production shot that you'll have seen, you'll have seen that the back light through the set is emulating the sun enhancing the sinister nature to the audience that they can't see who is going to come onto the stage. So if we now lose the front light that's lighting me, you will now start to see the backlight on Satria take effect. So when you can see he's walking onto stage, we now lose the ability to see his face clearly, which enhances the sinister nature of coming into the jewel scene and also intensifies what we are about to see. So Dan, this is really dramatic um, but, and very mysterious because I can't see his face. But I think possibly for the audience that might be a little bit difficult because if we can't see his facial expressions, it's a little bit hard to understand what's going on. Yep, you're absolutely right. And we've done that deliberately as a design suggestion in this part of the show. So where Satria is going to enter, it means that the audience, because the audience can't see his face, it adds to the sinister nature of what we're about to witness to begin with. So just as an added theatrical effect, we've got some haze in use at the moment here, which shows the beam of this light. In, and what you'll have seen from the production shot is how that also enhances Satria's profile or the actor's profile as they come in. It makes them look really, really big as they come into the so then if we then bring in Satria into the stage, we can then show an additional element. So if we look at side light, as we talked about earlier, if we look about how this light then lights Satria and adds to his profile, it enhances the costume, it generates some extra shadows, and it also gives a really interesting element for the audience to look at on the stage. How we then balance these lights is we then change their intensity put it into a cue list structure, which then the audience uh, will never know is played back every night from a stage manager in position. We've looked at side light, we've looked at back light. Now let's have a look at front light. If we move this front light round to the front of Satria, you'll see how it generates something much flatter, changes his profile, it changes how big he looks to the audience, and it also is slightly less interesting in this section to look at because it's not as intense as the side and the back light. So with that, the classic example of how we use front light might be during the curtain call, which is when you'll then be giving your applause at the end of the production. I can't believe how many different looks with the lights we've got here, just two lights that you've just been able to show us. Thank you, Satria. You may leave the stage and go get ready for your scene. So Dan, I imagine you have done shows and lit shows with many more than just two lights. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got into lighting? 
I can, absolutely. Uh, so I started off um, in my amateur dramatic society uh, in my village at home. Uh, I started by playing Dick Whittington uh, on the stage in our local pantomime. Uh, it all went slightly downhill when I was asked to be a bear the following year. So uh, it wasn't groundbreaking enough to stay on the stage. So I therefore uh, got curious about what was behind the curtain and I started uh, looking at lighting. I got really, really interested in lighting. When I went out anywhere, I, we used to photograph things, look at shadows, um, different times of day, and then actually found out that it was a career. I went to see uh, the Royal Shakespeare's uh, production of Hamlet uh, when I started secondary school, um, and having a tour backstage then set off the bug. Uh, I had a really good secondary school theatre where it allowed me to experiment, play around, and that's really the point really, is experimenting and playing around, getting as much hands-on experience as you can, really helped me then progress in my skills to where I've got to now. So Dan, what is your career highlight to date? One of my favourites, I think, that will stick with me for a long time uh, was being at Windsor Chapel with lighting director Bernie Davis for the wedding of uh, Princess Eugenie. Uh, it was a royal wedding, so our job in there was to emulate uh, daylight during the, the service. It was televised live, and I was in as a console operator, and I think hearing the Queen walk into the chapel uh, after the silence of the fanfare will stick with me forever. Wow, a royal wedding, no less. How amazing. So we have our set and we have our fantastic lighting for this scene, but there is one more little design detail we need. Cue snow. So here we have the magic that is some snow. And this is, I'm gonna tell you how this is happening. So over in the wing over there is a brilliant flyman, Steve, who is pulling some ropes. Those in turn, oh, mouthful of snow. Those in turn are moving the snow bag up there, which has holes in it, and the snow falls out of the holes onto the stage. So, and as you'll see, we've now changed our lighting once again to change it to side light so we can make sure that the snow is lit like it's 3D. <gasps> wow, the magic of theatre, eh? You look like you've got quite a lot of snow going on on your head there. It's very cold. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much to both of you. And it is wonderful to hear about another career path within this brilliant genre of opera. Now, they've fabulously set the scene for our duel and Lenski has arrived first. So let's find out what happens. to get into the soul of Lenski. 
we keep talking about the word aria. Aria is just the Italian word for song, for, for one person to sing. Um, and in the history of opera, aria might have been the time when the singer could show off, give their, 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 their highest notes, their most exciting sounds. Um, and the plot might have stopped at that point. But really here, Tchaikovsky was far too much of a dramatist and he wanted to embed his aria absolutely into the story and let us see what was going on in Lenski's soul. Let's invite Satria over. Satria, tell us a little bit what it, what it feels to sing an aria like that. Yeah, so Lenski, I could say this music, Tchaikovsky really give the idea of Pushkin how to be a poetry. It's like the artistry, you can hear from the beginning. Dum, pum, dum, pum. It's like the heartbeat. And then, -da 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 -da. yes, that's the spring sound. And then he put Lensky in a very cold winter for the duel. So you can see the contrast between the spring and the dark. And Lensky just put in a trouble, basically. Yeah, and I feel it's very nice, yeah. And such is the brilliance of Tchaikovsky that while you're telling that fantastic story, mm. you're also showing your voice off to brilliant <laughs> effect. Those fabulous high notes. Yeah. While the orchestra's playing really low to give us that sense of space and, as you say, light and dark yeah. that's going on in between. Indeed. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Satria. Thank you. And as Satria said, Pushkin. Alexander Pushkin was the writer of the original Eugene Onyekin, which was a novel written in verse form and actually uh, written to be sold in installments, um, which is fascinating because as, as people bought installment one, they weren't going to know how the story was going to turn out. Um, the horrible fascinating fact about uh, Pushkin was that three years before Tchaikovsky was born, Pushkin himself died in a duel in very similar circumstances to our own Onyegin and Lensky and Tatiana. Goodness, that is very tragic. I'm interrupting because we do need to get back to our scene and Onyegin has just arrived at the scene of the duel. And let's just hope that these two young men can actually sort it out and not go ahead with the duel. Well, it looks like Onyegin and Lensky are going to go ahead with this duel. And on this stage, Michael Boyd's production captures the tension of this moment. And we're going to show it now. Thank you. 
My goodness, Onyegin has just shot dead his best friend Lensky. So in order to stage something like this, I'm going to bring Rhiannon, our designer, back in. And Rhiannon, I'd, I know that there's probably a whole team of people to make a fight scene like the one we've just experienced work. Yes, exactly, Karen. So on stage, we need particularly the expert uh, advice of a fight director for this type of action. So they are trained and can then train performers to do this kind of sequence of action really carefully. And they will work really closely with the performer and also with the costume designer because it could well be that in order to do this safely, there might need to be some padding in the costume to make sure it happens safely so that it can be done really realistically on stage. So it's time to invite Natasha, our fight director, in. So Natasha, I noticed that Onyegin fell first and we thought that he had actually died. How do you fall like that or how do you teach an actor to fall like that? Well, first of all, I'll show you how he fell, but in slow motion. So he's got a really wide leg stance. He's looking right down the barrel of the pistol and he, in slow motion, he gets hit in that shoulder. So he does a full turn, takes the weight onto the back leg and then rolls it hips and hands and down. I couldn't do that last bit in slow motion, but you kind of get the gist of yeah. what that would feel like. So then if you speed it up a bit more, you just have to make the, the shot as fast as you can. So it's like, powerful drop. So pretty much like that. So I'm going to invite Jerome in so you can show us teaching an actor how to fall. It's interesting how complex that feels. So we would have done a warm up to make sure everything's ready to go. The first thing I'd look at is just that half a turn. So facing up stage, just imagine like someone slapped you around the face, but maybe it's your shoulder, that kind of slap. So I would go one, two, three, and slap, and just what, really keep building that up until you're off balance. Let's try a few more. So ready, and hit. And let me have a look at one. So you're really realistically, someone's pushed you, whacked you, and where does that take you? Ready, one, two, three, whack! That one was great. And then you want to relax, relax as you do the turn. Then that's going to take you into the floor. Yep. So before we go for it, we would turn back down stage and just look at how you melt down safely to the floor. Put the weight on the left leg. You're going to just take that right leg off. You're going to bend down the left leg. You're going to put your knee down first. You're going to engage your core as you go. Get the hip ready, hand, and you're going to twist into the floor to make it look even more realistic and have a moment where you're all the way down. Great, let's try a couple of those. I'll do one with you up to speed and then we'll have a look how you're getting on. You ready? So, really poised, really strong stance. One, two, three, shot, down, go. <laughs> How's that? Can we have a look at one more? Let me just check that so I'd make you do it loads in rehearsals. You ready? Yep. One, two, three, go. Great, and we will keep working on that until you're feeling really comfortable and safe. Great, thanks, Tasha, and thank you, Jerome. But actually, it's Lensky that dies, isn't it, and falls, and he has quite a different fall. Could you talk us through that? He does. I'm going to do one for you in slow motion, so I'm just going to head here. So he has it in two parts. 
he kind of puts the, first of all, he sees what's happened. That makes him sink a little bit. And as he's sinking, he's hinging forward. He very cleverly takes the weight onto the back leg, rolls, peels, rolls sideways, but then onto his back. So there's a lot of technique going on in that one. So up to speed, that one. Well, actually, it's not up to speed because it's really slow. So he gets hit. He sees it. Sees it. Starts to bend into the knees and takes it all the way down. So quite different. Really so different. let's invite Satria over to go so you can teach an actor how to do that of moment. Course, of course. So Satria, if you come to this end of the mat, Obviously, we would have done a warm-up. We would have been focusing a bit more on your core and doing some press-ups because this is quite a dramatic fall. Let's take it in stages. So the first thing, left hand, boom, hit on the chest. You look down, really sustain that. Then you're going to bend your knees. So really sinking down into your knees. And just we're going to practice the hinge. You can relax your arms for a minute. So a hinge, you're going from the knees, pitching back, coming back, engaging the core. Pitching back, coming back. Just try that a few times. And pitching and then this time when you do it I want you to take a little bit more weight onto the left leg so pitching back a little bit onto that back leg so that one becomes free and then we can do our roll happy with that yep. great then we're going to face down stage and we're just going to do safely gliding through like we had to do on Jagen's um, drop weight on the left leg right leg up lowering down into your knee engaging your stomach muscles hip side we're going to roll shoulder to back and collapse everything into the floor sinking and hold it there. Let's try and just get that glide to the floor a little bit faster. You ready? We're going to go, because the fall is, is not too, too slow. You ready? Here we go. And melt down into the floor. Off you go. Melting. Lovely. You can even go a little bit more on your side and then your back. Should we try and put it together? Yep. I think you're ready. Okay. okay, so here we go. You've got your hip. Use your breath, breathing in to sustain it. Starting to slide back, pitching off on that leg and rolling through and all the way. Great, and we would just practice that over and over again until he felt really comfortable. And it's much slower, it seems much slower than the other fall. It is slower, more is muscle power needed. Yeah. yeah, so a little bit harder potentially. And this is the blood moment. So Rhiannon, I'm assuming that we're not using tomato ketchup. No, Karen, this is not tomato ketchup. This, in this little pellet in my hand, is stage blood. Now, stage blood comes in lots of different colours and also different thicknesses, depending on what you're using it for. And this is exactly how they did it in the production. It's actually brilliantly low-tech. It's a little pouch of cling film that's then twisted, so it's like a balloon, so it's under pressure. And this is what the performer has in their hand as they do this fall. Great, well, let's see it in action. <laughs> it's an amazing moment. Fascinating. Well, that worked, didn't it? So I'm now going to ask Jerome to come back in and I'm going to ask you to be in character as Onyegan and just tell us how you feel now that you've killed your best friend, Lenski. Lenski had all his life ahead of him and I ended it in that moment when I shot him. Um, we didn't need to fight because of feelings of our reputation and pride and honor, we did that and it's left me completely broken and I'm lost for words. So Onyegan is broken and to find out what happens next, you're gonna have to tune in next time. We're all gonna say goodbye, but I'm gonna leave you with this moment of the jewel and you can watch it with fresh, eyes with everything you've just seen. Beat.